Hello, everybody out in uh, our online community. Welcome. It's, uh, well, it's good to see the camera this morning. So, uh, yeah, the red light's on, so we know we're uh, at least you can see us and probably hear us now. So, uh, yeah, it's been a great, uh, long, and uh, somewhat tiring weekend, but uh, ministry is just that, uh, right? When we're pressing in and God's moving in. Uh, we see what people were doing. We had a rummage sale this weekend. So, uh, thank you to everybody who uh, helped with that. It was amazing. Um, just a good week. Uh, and uh, it's kind of kicking off a busy, um, or I should say, up to speed kind of summer. Because we've, we've not had the, 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 the things we've offered and the classes and the things that um, times of gathering, so we're really looking forward to uh, doing more of that. So let's pray and uh, we will uh, just ask the Holy Spirit to, to just be, be welcome and uh, do mighty works in us this morning. So Jesus, we, uh, we come to you. We thank you that uh, your love is everlasting. And that your mercies are new daily. And that uh, your grace is enough. And that's, uh, that's so amazing. Because I think for me, sometimes I make it harder than it is to just receive what you're doing in our lives and in my world. So Holy Spirit, uh, just fall fresh now on each one of us, in our minds and our hearts. And do a mighty work. And let us let us not leave the same way that we've come today. So we just ask, open our eyes to see and our ears to hear all that you're doing today. And uh, we just uh, want to see where you lead us this morning. Not only in music, but in the message. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So if you feel like standing, you can get to your feet or whatever's comfortable. We're going to put the words up on the screen. And through our music, we are just hopefully going to reach out and not only love Jesus, but be loved by Him.
morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi everyone online. We are streaming live online and you can also find it on YouTube and Facebook later on. Uh, today we are continuing the sermon series, 10 words plus one. Um, Pastor Brian's message today is you shall not commit adultery found in Exodus. Grab your Bible or follow along in the bulletin. Food assembly boxes tomorrow, Monday, June 10th from 5 to 7 p.m. and Tuesday at a new time, starting at 11, we need volunteers uh, to set up the pantry, 3 p.m. to get ready for the distribution, and 6 p.m. Uh, we need volunteers to clean up. So anytime, come on down, we could use lots of help. Uh, something to look forward to, drive through pancake breakfast is coming June 18th, get ready. Uh, Pre-register on clock notes that just lets us know um, about how many pancakes and stuff to get ready the day of. To invite a friend, all of the money goes to our outreach ministries. And now we have a short video for our new um, <coughs> under construction building for the future. Hi, this is Doug Church, and uh, we're doing a video to promote a new program that we're beginning. It's called Under Construction. We all understand that that all of you and myself and all of us make up the body of Christ. But we also have a building that we meet in that represents, in some ways, um, Christ to our community. And our building is in pretty severe disrepair. And so we are hoping to raise some funds to be able to do some repairs uh, to the exterior of our building, our awning, uh, paint, the um, ephus on the sides of the fellowship hall, in a parking lot, many other things that we're hoping to be able to accomplish, depending on how much we raise. We're also hoping to be able to replace our sound system, which we've had some ongoing issues with, especially in this day and age of uh, video recording. And so um, there was a passage in the Old Testament, in the book of Haggai, where the people are asking, um, or basically kind of, the, the whole temple of God is in disrepair from, from the uh, invaders that had come in over in the country, and they had pretty much trashed the temple. And the people were trying to put their own lives together, and at the, at the same time, the prophet comes along and says, is it time for you to be finishing your own houses when God's house is sitting in disrepair? And he's just asking a question. Um, is, it, is it time? And I guess that's the question I want to propose to you today. Is, is it time? Do you feel like God is calling you to help us to repair the facilities that have been used to feed and to bring the gospel of Jesus and to bring healing and restoration to thousands of lives over the years? Um, is it time to begin to just do some basic maintenance on our facilities to repair the and replace the, the flooring and that carpeting and to do some other things that are long overdue? So I would encourage you and and challenge you to ask God what He would have you do above and beyond your regular giving. It really wouldn't help us, and it won't help us if you just um, switch your giving from what you're regularly giving to the building program. That's not going to help at all. So this would be above and beyond, it would be a sacrificial gift to God, and it would help us to do our job, um, probably even help us to do a little bit better in the sense that it's going to be a little bit better for new people who come in and see the facilities and are just trying to figure out who this Jesus is. It's also going to help us, for those who already go here, it's always nice to come home and have our house clean and straightened up, at least. Um, I like it that way, although if you went in my man cave, it wouldn't really look like it. Uh, anyway, I just want to encourage you to pray, think about, um, read over the materials that we're going to be giving to you. We have some good materials that are going to be coming in a brochure that will explain everything in more detail. And again, this will be a graduated program, so the more money we get, the more things we can do. God bless. Bye. And now my construction crew, come on down. That was, a, that was a really handsome guy, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and I just wanted to say our youth at our event helped make all these magnets. Um, so if you see them, thank them. Thank you. <laughs> 
So the magnets, the magnets are made out of nails. To remind you, so you put this up someplace that, that will remind you, you know, this about this program. Um, we took the nails, they had to clean them and wash them and scrub them and, and put them together and, and then add the magnets to it. So it was construction to make these. Keeps vampires away. And it keeps vampires away, Francis. <laughs> so pull out your brochure if you didn't see your brochure. Um, we are doing this in phases. And phase one, we have uh, estimated about $45,000 it will take to do the things that we want to do. So we're asking that you would read over the brochure and look and see about the stuff we want to do. Like we said, we've had issues for quite a while with our soundboard and stuff. So it's really important. We want to be able to have good worship service here. We want to be able to have a good presence online. So it's, it's kind of important. We've had to rig things up and it's just crazy. Um, we've not had ever had heating or air conditioning in the lobby area. You know, and sometimes you walk in, it's like, oh, it's so hot, you know. So there are things that we're starting to do. We, we're starting that project already in faith. We're believing that God's going to provide the money, however he's going to do that. So we've already started pricing that out and ordering things, and we're going to get that going right away. But you do have a pledge card, so we're asking that you read the pledge card. Um, we're asking that you at least pray daily or weekly for the under construction campaign. <coughs> and then to the best of your ability, if you can do pledge a weekly or a monthly offering toward this program, um, you can you can tear it off or cut it at the dotted line and start putting in an offering basket next week so that we can see you know what we're looking at. But again, we have started this in faith because we believe this is something that God has called us to do. And we believe that he has always, you know, last time we did, what year was that we did, 2015? Yeah. When we did the, the yeah. other construction, adding the fellowship hall, that was at the worst time ever to do it. Oh, 2004. <laughs> we, it was, we, we just, that was just crazy, a crazy time to do it, but we did it in faith, and God provided, and we were able to build it. So we believe that this is what God's calling us to do. Do you have anything else? Are you a bad thing? I'm not a vampire, that's why I'm still here. <laughs> oh, Alright, so look at all your stuff, please pray over it, and yes, Marvin? Uh, if you do, you want a separate check for this so you know what it goes Well, we're going to try to separate this out as much as possible, so it would be beneficial if we have a separate check or a separate offering that you can split it. Because again, this is an above and beyond your tithing. Please do not take some of your tithing money and put it toward this. This would be if you have extra sacrificial money that you can give. So it would be beneficial to have it in a separate envelope or a separate check so that it's easy to keep it separate. Because we want to make sure all that money stays in one specific account to be constantly used for the building program. Any other questions? Anybody got anything else they want to add? This is most of our um, most of our building um, under construction team. We have someone who decided not to dress up, so I told me whether or not to come up here. <laughs> so, you don't want to dress up like that, then don't come and ruin our house. So again, put this someplace where you can see it, where you'll always remember it, and pray over and read over this, this information, and get us back your uh, pledge card. Uh, next week you can start just putting in the offering. Okay? Did you have something, Linda? Yeah. Your enemy, like, designate, like, like a one-time gift? And you don't yes. Absolutely. You could do a one-time gift, you could do a weekly, a monthly, any way you want to donate. Okay, just write that in on the pledge card. Yes. As long as it's over $100,000. Well, Brent said as long as it's over $100,000. <laughs> so basically, it's game, give me your darn money. I only got All right, thank you guys so much. If you have any questions, yes. I, want to, I just want to say something. I know a lot of you think this is a lot of money, but just remember, if 100 people gave two dollars a week more that's ten thousand dollars right some of you can get five some of you can get ten we can do this and you can't build anything with one now that's right that's right yeah. alicia can, can, we, can we uh promote this to help get done? absolutely we're, we're already promoting out other places if you have places you want to promote this and you need information let us know okay yeah so like i have a brother who always donates to stuff we do because he believes in what we do here so if you know anybody else that might want to donate toward it, absolutely, we'll get you all the information you need. Okay? God bless. Amen. And then just don't forget your offering um, either online, Facebook, PayPal, or at the end of uh, at the back of the sanctuary. <laughs>
And now here comes our message. I feel a little crowded up here. I'm not sure. There's, there's probably a reason for that. I just haven't quite figured out what it is. It's my ride home? Okay. Okay. Um, today, welcome. Today, uh, and if you're new, welcome, welcome. We're, gonna, we're not going to talk about anything hard, just sex and uh, lust and adultery. So, hey. Um, and if you're here and you're sitting here and you're going, you know, I recognize that probably close to half, 40% of our congregation is single. Um, but this passage, Jesus broadens it, the passage we're going to be looking at, and broadens it to a, a much wider scope and deals with, which he always does when he deals with things, deals with the whole area of sexuality in our lives. And so I'm going to attempt to try and unwrap that a little bit, and we're going to be talking about some um, sexual addiction. We're going to be talking about just the impact of sexuality, the beauty of sexuality, the dangers that are involved with it. And, um, and so let's first pray. Lord, I, I, I ask for your help because you're the one that created this. You made us. You said you created Adam and Eve, and then you told them to be fruitful and multiply and they were naked and not ashamed. And Lord, we live in so much shame. So many women live in shame of their bodies. So many men live in shame of their bodies. We live in so much shame of, uh, for past things we've done or struggles we have or thoughts we have. And God, we pray today that you would come in your great power and mercy and restore us to, um, may, may we be a light shining, restore us to that beauty and the beauty that you originally created where Adam and Eve stood and were naked and had no shame. Amen. Somebody asked me, are we going to become a nudist church? And the answer is no, we're not. Um, no, nobody asked me that. Uh, so the other day I was um, yeah, on Memorial Day. By the way, um, uh, some of you know Danelle Chappelle. He graduated from college this week. He did. He got his associate's degree. So, hey, Danelle, we got you. Any other, anybody else graduate this this spring? Or, yeah, okay. Yeah, we always want to recognize that because that's a that's a big achievement and it's a cool achievement. And we're so we're so proud of Danelle. He, Danelle used to pastor or um, help pastor our University Circle Church. So, um, so. Let me let me talk about this just to begin with. It it, it I, I thought about this and I was and, and by the way Victoria's with us too. Hi 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 Vicky. Um, I I remember uh, on Sun not re I remember on Sunday we had um, Jackie and Danelle. Uh, Jackie is part of our community, so so is Danelle, and um, we were doing a grilling cookout and Jackie's. Just got a home, and she's trying to figure out, um, okay, how do you know? How do you do this? So she's watching me, and I'm carefully giving her instructions. I like charcoal because I think charcoal smells cool and stuff like that. And I'm telling her we have one of those little pot things you can put on there that, you know, a grilling fry pan kind of thing. Have you ever seen those? Yeah. No. You guys are really mellow today. This is going to be tough. Um. So anyway. So I'm showing you that. I'm just saying, you know, you just have to assume everything that's on there, this metal is going to be really hot. And while the whole time I'm holding like a cake pan and I'm taking off corn and I'm taking off brats and I'm putting it in there, you know, and part of the cake pan is sitting over the, over the coals. And so I'm telling her, and I said, so, you know, sometimes you'll get surprised. You have to be really, really careful when, whenever there's anything metal. Um, just don't go near it. Don't touch it. Watch it. And right after I said that, I go and I grab the other side of the pan, and guess what? Psst, sizzle, sizzle. And, and so I just cracked up, and I thought, there's your first lesson. Don't do that. So today, I, I really I want to talk about how you deal with sexual desires in our lives without getting burned. Because so many of us have gotten burned in this area. And there's two 
ways we look at this. Our society looks at it um, sometimes with a too low a view. We don't respect it enough. And then suddenly we find ourselves caught in, in, in a major struggle. And this is huge with so many people with, I bet, a huge amount of guys here struggling with pornography. Because it's not like the old days when, when I was growing up where you had to sneak and find a playboy under your father's bed or something like that, which wasn't a good thing. But <clears throat> nowadays, you literally hold it in your hand. It's right there. And so, the, if we have too low a view of sexuality, it can be very destructive, and we'll talk about that. But I also want to talk about, sometimes we have too high a view of it, and we think of it as basically a god. We're almost like in the, in the New Testament, where they had literal temples of fertility, and they worshipped it. They worshipped sexuality. And that's another danger, that we look at it and we think, okay, this w- if I just get this right, I can be ultimately satisfied and fulfilled and filled up. And so my first point is that sex is good, but it's not ultimate. It's not God. Sex is good, but it's not God. So let me just read the passage. This is from... Exodus 20, it says, you shall not commit adultery, very direct. And then Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, says, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. And everybody's like, yeah, okay, you know, I'm good. And the, but then he goes on and he says, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully, and this isn't just for women, he's talking about, or not, this isn't just for men is looking at, you know, talking about women, men, whoever, looks at a woman lustfully, has already committed adultery in their heart. And so pretty much all of us are like, oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's like, that's pretty, the standard pretty high, isn't it? And he goes on and he says, this is how significant, this is how powerful this thing called sex is. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body and be thrown into hell. And that's, that sounds really radical, but what Jesus is saying is that we, we, this, if, we, if we mess around with this in the wrong ways, it will burn us. It will burn us. It can hurt us. It can destroy lives. It does destroy lives. I've seen it destroy lives. And so, let me just read a, a couple of quotes here on it. What One writer says this, what Jesus is pushing back against, and this is our cultural battle, because this is a huge thing in our culture, isn't it? We've deified sexuality to the point where we're um, trying to, for kids, so many kids, if you have anybody or know anybody that's young, so many kids are wrestling with their sexual identity because there's this idea that somehow if I can figure out the right sexual identity, I will be satisfied. I'll, the thing that's wrong with me is that I don't, you know, maybe I'm a boy and maybe I was supposed to be a girl. Maybe I'm a girl and I'm supposed to be a boy. And so on and so forth. And, and the challenge with that is that it's saying that somehow if we figure out and do this thing right sexually, that we'll be okay. And the reality is, it doesn't work that way. That is not our primary identity. Our our gender, our sex, is not our primary identity. Our primary identity, if we're a follower of Jesus, is being a child of God. We are a child of God, first and foremost. That's where we find our solid identity. That's where we find the rock that we live on. And as followers of Jesus, one of the things we need to do is just be immensely graceful, I think, in the culture that we live in because we're called to be missional in our culture. We're called to be missionaries. And if we're missional in a culture, the first thing we do is not go out and start screaming about what's wrong. My brother works in um, uh, some, a, a place in Africa from time to time. 
and a lot of a lot of the people there, a lot of the kings and over different areas have like little tribal groups and stuff. A lot of the kings have like ten or twelve wives. So if 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 the first thing he does when bringing Jesus into that area is go, okay, you need to get rid of all your wives except the first one. Do you realize how destroying that would be? So we look at this missionally. Something I read that was really kind of interesting, too. It was really funny. It was a, a mission team that was going to be going to another part of, a, of another country. And in this other part of the other country, it was not at all unusual for the women not to wear tops. There's still parts of the world where women just don't wear tops. But the, the person that was leading the small team, the small mission team, said, but make sure your ankles are covered up. Because the ankles are the sacred place. And if you have uncovered ankles, that's considered really inappropriate. Isn't that interesting? So some of these things, they're different in different places. It's, a, it's just kind of an interesting thing when you do mission work. But this writer says, what Jesus is pushing back against, just because remember, all of, all of this is sin in the context of how do we live our lives. All of this is in the context of how we live our lives in the kingdom. How do we live life under the rule and reign of Jesus? Jesus is saying that it's impossible to live in his kingdom when we objectify his crown creation, which is humanity. It is impossible to live in his kingdom when we objectify the crown, his crown creation, which is humanity. Let me say that again, and I already said it again, so I won't. But I do think we're starting to see cracks in our prevailing modern-day philosophy. I think we're seeing cracks in people raising their voices. And some of this has happened out of the Me Too movement, saying no longer will we be silent when people run their desire and lust to the extreme and take advantage of other people. 81% of women surveyed recently would say that in some way they've been sexually harassed in their lifetime. And that is so accurate. I don't know how many women I've worked with who, when they were growing up, or even as they've gotten older, and I'm not, you know, I'm, it, it's, it's heart-wrenching to me because I deal with this all the time, and I would bet many of you, both men and women, have been objectified, have been used as just a sexual object to gratify somebody else's pleasure. And we're going to do some healing ministry at the end of this. None of us grew up with this right. I didn't grow up with it right. In fact, I remember the first time that my mom, my mom was the one that told me about sex. And I don't remember how old I was, fifth grade or sixth grade. I don't remember. But anyway, she told me about sex. So she's try, <laughs> trying to gently tell me about sex. And as she's telling me, I'm having these images. And I, I don't know... I. You know, at this point in life, I really don't even know what a woman, what women's body parts are. I mean, and my mom's like telling me this thing, and I won't go into detail. Don't worry, because it's you know, there's nothing worse than hearing sex stories about your parents or hearing sex stories about your pastor. So just things you don't want to know, don't want to have that in your brain. But this is what I thought when she told me this. I just had this picture of some hole somewhere in the woman. And, you know, and the man's part goes there. And I thought, that is awful. I will never do that. I will never do that. It's one of the worst things I've ever heard. It sounds terrible. And that's really genuine what I thought about sex. And then I'm not sure at what point I began to realize, oh, that is what it is. And then I kind of changed my mind on I will never do that. Um, but the reality is that that. All of us grow up with, with mis misconceptions, misideas. We objectify people. We place it. We place sexuality in this, this place that's so high that, especially for our single people, they feel like, well, somehow, am I incomplete if I'm celibate, if I just leave a, live a normal celibate life, if I don't have a spouse, if I'm not married? Am I incomplete? And the answer is absolutely not. Jesus Christ lived the most complete, full, satisfying life of any human being that has ever lived. 
And contrary to all the books and movies and whatever, he lived single. He was single. He was tempted, I'm sure, with, with sexual things when he was growing up. It says he was tempted in all ways like we are. And yet he was without sin. So somehow he walked this thing out. He lived that way. Probably Paul lived that way. Not people disagree about that. There's, there's this, oh, throughout history, millions of people have lived single, fulfilled, satisfied lives. And, and, and believe me, that, that if, if you're looking for, if you think, okay, if I, if I just get the perfect sex, then it will be like the ultimate. And it's like, well, I won't go there, but you know, it's, it says it, it's a, the ultimate problem is it's, it's, not the, it's not the way God intends us to find ultimate fulfillment in our life. It's one of the good things that he's given to us. And we've turned it into our consumer thing. Rich Nathan says this, even while God created our bodies and God created sex with a design, sex was never meant to be the ultimate meaning of life. And sexual intercourse apparently is not essential for thriving, self-actualized lives. Jesus, who is God's des design for man with a capital M, Jesus is God's highest expression of humanity. And Jesus never had sexual intercourse. So sex is good, but sex is not God. Sex is good, but sex is not God. Nothing, nothing God makes is God. Only God is God. But you know, we being sinful humans constantly distort God's good gifts. Everything God made is good, but we distort and we twist what God has made and we turn what is good into God. Take the gift of money. Money is good. It's a gift of God. It's a means of exchange. It, it's a reward for work. Great many things from, come from the gift of money. The building of churches. Ooh. The spread of the gospel the building of schools and hospitals, the relief of hunger. Because we have money, we can enjoy a vacation. We can have a dinner out with a friend or a sp spouse. Money is good. Do you know that God never says that, that money is evil? What does he say? The love of money. So the distortion of it. The distortion of sexuality is what the problem is. And so... Um, in, in fact, in our, in our culture, this is just some stats. According to various reports, the porn industry's net worth is about $97 billion. That's more than the NHL, MLB, the NFL. What did I leave out? What? NBA, MSL, soccer. Uh, how do you say is it? What's soccer? MSL, ML, uh, ML. Where's Marvin? He just appeared. Always work with the kids. Okay. So anyway, it's bigger than all those things. It's bigger. It's bigger than, than all of our blockbuster movies. It's huge. And along with it goes, goes all the terrible things, the sex trafficking, the sexual abuse. And so this beautiful thing that God has given us has become this thing that has, has wreaked havoc in a society that has become super hypersexualized. We're, we're all looking for a God. But we don't find it in that. One of the problems, one of the challenges with something that's really awesome and beautiful and good, like food. I love food. I'm a foodie. Any foodies out there? I just love good food. I love, I would, I would like just, I would, if there was like a good lobster tail there, I would be tempted to just say, you know what, you can all go home. I'm just going to go eat. No, I wouldn't really. But, you know, I, I just really care about food. But guess what happens if I begin to make food an ultimate thing? <laughs> this does. This does. It can destroy you. All of God's good things. So our problem, according to Jesus, is not with sexual desire. God, do you know that God, think about this, God made sex, okay? God made sexual desire. The problem with it, according to Jesus, isn't sex or sexual desire. The problem is lust. 
And he said, you have heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Do you realize that, 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 that lust and, and, and that kind of sexuality is just such a huge driving force in our culture? If you want to know how powerful love is or intimacy or sexuality, listen to the number of songs there are about love. How many songs are there about your job? Why not? You know, like, one, yeah, take this job and, yeah, right. And so, you know, we, we don't make up songs about things that we, there are a lot of songs about cars. We like cars. There's a couple songs about motorcycles. There's some songs, like there's a song about, a couple songs about baseball. Take me out to the ball game. If you ever want to hear a great version of Take Me Out to the Ball Game, find Ozzy Osbourne's. It was just, you know, from Black Sabbath. Ozzy Osbourne does this, this most amazing version of Take Me Out to the Ball Game. He must have been blitzed out of his mind, and he didn't get any of the words right. I think maybe he got one of the words right, bass or peanuts and cracker jacks or something. But we have songs about it. In fact, so I was reading about, like, what are some of the worst love songs ever? And, and, and somebody wrote in, which actually the lyrics are, are kind of interesting, but the whole idea is kind of horrible. It's that, the Pina Colada song. If you, you know, it's about these two people that, that, or this one person that's not happy in his marriage, and he goes out and he, you know, to, sends something out to one of the things out there, like uh, the equivalent to Ashley Madison, which, by the way, is huge. Cleveland and Cincinnati, you know what Ashley Madison is? I shouldn't even tell you. It's a site where you can go and just have an affair. Nobody will know. There's over probably, at this point, 70 million people that use it. And I, shouldn't, I don't want to give you ideas here. But, the, but that's the reality. That's how prevalent this is in our culture. And one of the worst love songs, they were, according to at least one person, was the Pina Glotta song. If you love... You know, making love in midnight in the tombs of the king, blah blah blah. You know the song. You guys know the song. So, okay, okay. So, so some, yeah. So somebody, somebody said so, and I, and I and I thought it was so funny because they just said so. Here we have a song, basically about two people who are wanting to go have an affair with another person, and what, lo and behold, guess what happens? They find themselves, and you go, well, wait. There's something wrong with that. But again, God's desire and is, is, is not to take joy away from us. It's to bring satisfaction to us. Our desires are not too high. They're too low. We settle, like C.S. Lewis said, we settle for mud pies on a dirty street when we're offered a holiday by the sea in a castle. We're too easily satisfied. And so Jesus says, whoever looks, and the, the term look there means to not, it, it doesn't mean, and we'll get into this in a minute too, it doesn't mean to just have a glance and a thought and be tempted. That's different. It, it means to actually look and keep on looking, but also to begin looking in our imagination and creating a scenario. And guess what happens eventually? It's kind of the same with what we talked about with murder last week. Where does it start? It starts in that, that seed. And we allow that seed into our life, and then that seed grows. We find ourselves attracted to somebody. We sort of kind of generally push that way. And we'll get into in a minute, what do we do about that? And the answer, very simply, is run away. Run away as fast as you can. The term that's used for, for um, lust in this, uh, who, who looks at a woman lustfully, is um, it's something like, in the Greek, it, like hyperthemia or hyperthemia. It's, it means to, be, to have over-desire, to, to over-desire something, like being an alcoholic and a drug addict. 
there was there was an over desire in my life for drugs and alcohol. Just an over desire. I just loved it. I thought it would satisfy my life. I poured my life into it. And by the time I was done, I could barely even get high anymore. I couldn't I couldn't even be normal anymore. I lost almost all my friends. I was stealing. I was passing out drunk in bathrooms and peeing myself. I remember laying on the floor once at a, a Pink Floyd movie and I was drunk and passed out and I had thrown up and I was had urinated all over myself and somebody just looked over at me and said, you're disgusting. And that happens with a lot of people. Here's the way, here's what um, G.K. Chesterton says. He said, the man who knocks on the door of the brothel is really looking for God. Do you understand that? We're looking for God. And this is a powerful thing. And God creates things to be good. Let me read you Psalm 140. For those of you, like when God created creation, Adam and Eve, he said what? It is very good. Right? He, God's all about it. He says, praise the Lord, my soul, for you are very great. You have clothed. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. The Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in their waters. He rides the wings of the wind. His he makes his winds his messengers and flames his fire. He sets the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. You covered it with watery depths as with a garment. And he goes on and he says, he makes springs pour out... Springs pour out water in the ravines, and it flows between the mountains. They give water to the beasts of the field, and the wild donkeys quench their thirst. The birds of the sky nest in the waters. They sing among the branches. He waters the mountains from his upper chambers, and the land is satisfied. He, ma he makes grassy growth for cattle and plants for people to cultivate, bringing forth flu food from the earth, wine that gladdens the heart, oil to make their faces shine and bread that sustains their hearts. He makes things beautiful. And so, sexual intimacy and desire is, one of, is ultimately one of God's greatest gifts to us. It's just a beautiful gift. But it's not an ultimate gift. Again, in Genesis, it talks about that. It talks about um, uh, just the beauty of it. There's a there's a psalm or the song called S Song of Solomon. Have you ever read Song of Solomon? It's like, it's a, and if you come to parts and you go, is, are they talking about? It's like, yes, they are. It's very vivid. Here's just one example. How beautiful you and pleasant you are, O oh loved one, with all your delights. Your stature is like a palm tree. Your breasts are like cl clusters. This is a man speaking to a woman. I will climb the palm tree and lay hold of its fruit. Oh, may your breasts be like clusters of the vine, and the scent of your breath be like apples, and your mouth like, like the best wine. And then here's the woman's response. My beloved is radiant and ruddy. I think ruddy is, what is I don't know, this red, I can't remember. Distinguished among 10,000. His head is the finest gold, and his locks are wavy, black as a raven. His eyes are like dove, beside streams of water bathed in milk, sitting beside the pool. His cheeks are like beds of spices. His, lip, his lips are like lilies. His arms are rods of gold with set with jewels. His body is polished ivory, bedecked with sapphires. His legs are alabaster. And it goes on and on. And it talks about sexuality there, the whole book. That's a whole book about the beauty of sexuality. But we have turned it into a commodity. We have turned it into a commodity. So what do we do? So, you know, my, my first, again, one of the things I want to really communicate, you know, to us as a community is that, that this is a beautiful thing that God created. It's an awesome thing. It's not the ultimate thing. And if you're single, it's not, it's, it doesn't mean that you're incomplete. If that's the case, then Jesus was incomplete. 
So how do we deal with it? And Jesus tells us. He says, if your eye causes you to sin, cut it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Isn't that interesting? Why does he use those two particular things there? I think he uses them because what do we do with our eyes? We look in our hands. Or in our case, we use our phones. Is he literally saying that we should cut off our hands and pluck out our eyes? No, because ultimately that wouldn't help. We'd have a bunch of one-handed, one left-handed, left-eyed people who still struggle with lust and are mad because they don't have a right hand and a right eye. So it doesn't help. How do we deal with it? The first step, I think, in any of this stuff is to come to to come to Jesus and, and acknowledge that we have this struggle. I, you know, I'm just going to, this is like an AA meeting for me, okay? Only it's with sex. Hi, my name is Brent, and I struggle with lust. I do. I'm just being real with you. It's a struggle for me. So the first thing we do is acknowledge that, yeah, that's what part of me is like. It's not what I want to be like. It's not ultimately what Christ has created me to be like. There's parts of me that like, that likes the feeling even of lusting. Do you, do you understand that? And part of what we have to do is get to the place where we go, okay, I am not going to be empty and I'm not going to be unjoyful if I get rid of that part of my life. If I ask God to pluck it out, I am not going to be left with nothing. I'm not going to have an empty cup or an empty bowl. So the first step, Jesus says, when they're asking him, why does he eat and drink with sinners and tax collectors? So by the way, if you're somebody who struggles with lust, you're in good company. Jesus answered, it's not the health you need, doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So the first thing we do is just acknowledge it. And acknowledge that, yeah, that is, that is part of who I am. That is part of what, what I struggle with, you know? Sometimes when people go out and do something, they say, I, I don't know why I did that. And I'm just like, I do. Because there's something inside that's not right. And you have to deal with that. And sometimes we have to deal with it radically. Be radical with it or it will destroy you. Eugene Peterson, in his commentary on the, in the message, or not, it's not a commentary, it's a translation of the Bible. I love it. He says this, let's not pretend this is easier than it really is. If you want to live a morally pure life, here's what you have to do. You have to blind your right eye the moment you catch, catch it in a lustful leer. You have to choose to live one-eyed or else be dumped in a moral trash heap. Or else have your life become a dumpster fire. Because that's what happens. And you have to chop off your right hand the moment you notice it raised threateningly. Better a bloody stump than your eternal being discarded and discarded for the dump. I'm just going to share <laughs> one of the most graphic examples I've seen of this. I had a guy come in to me once. And he came in and he looked like, I thought he was, first he was a heroin addict or something because he was pale white, really thin. He was shaken. And I, I said, okay, you know, what's up? And he said, my marriage is falling apart. I just lost my job. And, and, and I'm in a terrible place. And I said, what's going on? And he said, well, I started just a few years ago. I started just looking at these things of cheerleaders, sites of cheerleaders online. And he said it graduated. Kind of, it was a gateway drug kind of. And he said it graduated to, to regular porn. And it, it had moved on so far. And I, you know, some of you are going, well, I'm not that bad. But you know what? I'm just sharing this to let you know. It had moved on to the point where at this point, it was just, he was just looking at bestiality. And he could no longer, and this happens with a lot of, a lot of guys in particular, they, he could no longer have sex. He could no longer have regular sex. Isn't that amazing? Satan is so wicked that he can trick us into something that will actually keep us from experiencing the very thing 
who we're trying to satisfy with our, our lives with. And again, that's an extreme example. And it's hard. I understand that. I get it. I don't know what women go through in that struggle. I know that a lot of women have been hurt or objectified as the beginning of this then. By sexuality or even by having you know, a partner or somebody that you're with that struggles with that. What's Paul's response to it? Deal with it radically. Deal with it radically. Do whatever it takes. Go to an SA meeting, a sex anonymous meeting. Go to a counselor. Confess to somebody. It says in Scripture, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us and will cleanse us. And I, and, and I think biggest of all in this is getting to that place where we actually trust God with our sexuality. I think I told you numerous times about how when I was debating about receiving Jesus into my life, my one concern was that the morality and sexuality that God talked about. I thought it would be stifling. I thought it would be, you know, I looked at Christians and I thought they are prudes. They are so uptight about this sex thing. And we do come across like, you know, we, we come across like that sometimes. We don't project it as something immensely beautiful that God has created. But I, I just thought, well, this seems to say that this, I should only do this in marriage. I shouldn't be doing it outside of that. And this is when I'm a new Christian. I wasn't married, and I thought. And, and when I came to receive Jesus, part of my receiving Jesus was say, okay, I've got to trust you with this. And you know what? For once, I actually, and this is really specifically hard for guys, I read the owner's manual, which is the Bible. And I began to follow it. And guess what? And I'm not going to go into detail. But it was good, like God said. It was very good. And it is very good. And if you want more details, just come up to Teresa afterwards and ask. So, my purpose this morning <clears throat> my purpose this morning is to bring an understanding, is to bring grace if you're struggling if you're not quite ready to, to let go just begin to ask God <laughs> many years ago there's a guy that was started coming to church and he he was like he was like Cheech and Chong together he was like a big pothead I'd go over and visit he came to church we were like hey come on in we had some we had one guy once come in and actually start lighting up a joint and he, my Tom Wadsworth, my friend, was with him. And Tom goes, it's not really the place where we just light up joints. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, you know, I, where was I going with that? I forgot. <laughs> Chicha Chung. Oh, yeah. So this guy's like massively addicted to pot. And I go out and we're just standing out out in the in the driveway and I just well can I pray for you about that he goes yeah I don't care sure whatever so I just said some prayer I said Jesus I pray that you would show him what's good and what real life looks like and show him what what it looks like to to really experience true life and you know what he said he didn't tell me this for about three years he goes you know when you prayed for me that one time I never smoked pot again and he said, and it's been so good. Now, that doesn't work that way for everybody. I've told you, for me, I had to go to meetings for, for years and years, and I still, have gone, I still go once in a while to recovery meetings because if we don't, we don't stay sober. You do whatever it takes. Here's, let me end with this. How many of you have seen one of these icebergs taken from underwater? Anyone? I think it's a good image of Jesus said, 
You've heard it was said statements. You've heard it was said you shall not commit adultery. And we can sort of place that at the top. That's where we can see. We can see the top of the iceberg. And today, maybe all that's showing in your life is the top of the iceberg. You can check that one off pretty easily. You shall not commit adultery. You either have or haven't done it. But Jesus wants to get underneath. Jesus wants to get the co at the core of our humanity. He wants to get the, to the reason that anybody would commit adultery. And he goes there. And he goes, there's something going on in your heart and in your life. There's something beneath the surface. And he goes, let's talk about that thing. Let's not just talk about the behavior and the action. Let's talk about the heart. Let's talk about the motivation. You do know that everything you do, everything you do, everything you execute, execute comes from your heart. Above all else, Psalm 423 says, guard your heart for everything flows from it. There's no such thing as an oops. That wasn't me. That was completely unlike me. Have you ever said that to yourself? Do you know what Jesus would say? No, no, that's exactly like you. Do you know why? Because you did it. We often want to run from that. We want to try and polish it up and say that it, it's not me. And Jesus says, no, no. Unless you actually look at, look at who, you, who you're becoming, you will never change the rhythm of your heart. You can keep covering it up and relegating it to the side and rationalizing it and justifying it and theorizing it. But it's you, and you know why you did it, and that's okay. For out of the heart comes thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. Jesus wants to address those things head on. But the first thing he wants to realize is that they're all coming from underneath and that God is so merciful and graceful he says, come to me, all you who are labor, and who, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you life. He is the ultimate life giver. He's the ultimate satisfier. Father, I just pray right now for those who are single. That somehow, Lord, you've, you've said that, that life can be, you, we can live a complete life. But I know a lot of my single friends don't want to stay that way, and I and I pray for them. I pray for good spouses today. I just pray for our single. If you know somebody single, just kind of think of them and pray for them right now. We pray for a good spouse, for our single friends. And I pray for our married, the married people that are just struggling. Lord. Some are struggling with, with what to do. They don't want to. They don't want to betray their spouse. They don't want to say anything. But it's such a struggle. And I pray for those who are struggling, Lord, that we wouldn't be living so much shame that we would be afraid to come to you. You said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, for my yoke is easy and my burden is life, and I bring a complete and full life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes.